Welcome to another literary reading in an extraordinary benefit series celebrating Alaska Quarterly Review's 40th anniversary. You can find recordings of previous programs at our website at aqreview.org and on our YouTube channel. Today, we have two, maybe three outstanding poets that I feel fortunate to share uh, the next hour with. It's also our first event of April, which is National Poetry Month, which was begun by the Academy of American Poets 25 years ago to remind us that poets have an integral role to play in our culture and that poetry matters. Over the years, it's become the largest literary celebration in the world with tens of millions of readers, students, teachers, uh, librarians, booksellers, literary event curators, publishers, families, and of course, poets, marking poetry's important place in our lives. Uh, one way I celebrate is um, through AQR contributing editor, uh, Jane Hirschfield's Poem A Day in my inbox and uh, closer to home in Alaska, the daily April poem broadsides by Alaskan poets at 49writers.org. And as always by ordering and buying poetry books from my local bookstore. And thanks to this series, I need more bookshelves. So welcome, I'm, I'm Heather Lendy, and, and on behalf of the Center for Narrative and Lyric Arts and our host, the Anchorage Museum at the Rasmussen Center, thank you for being here today. Gunasjish, as we say here on the banks of the Chilkat River in Haines, homeland of the Klinkit, Gilkat Kwan, and Jilkut Kwan. Uh, while this reading is free, AQR, like all literary journals, could use your help. So please consider a donation. And thank you very much to those of you who already have donated. We're, we're well on our way to our modest goal of $15,000. And now I'd like to introduce Ronald Spatz, who's the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Alaska Quarterly Review, a professor of English at the University of Alaska. Ron is a former National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and the recipient of the Alaska Governor's Awards too, actually, and a contribution to Literacy Award from the Alaska Center for the Book. Under Ron's four decades, 40 years plus of leadership and vision, Alaska Quarterly Review has created really strong connections between our state and the larger literary community in the US and been influential uh, in supporting new and emerging writers, as well as presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues. Ron? Yeah, thank you, Heather, and welcome everyone. Uh, as Heather said, this uh, event is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgments. Alaska Quarterly Review acknowledges the Anchorage Museum for hosting and providing technical support for this event, and Web 907 for its web support of Alaska Quarterly Review, and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, Alaska Quarterly Review's 501c3 umbrella organization, which makes this event possible. I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. AQR is located in Anchorage and Anchorage is Denina homeland. Denina is the language spoken by the traditional present and future caretakers of this land. Land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. Today, we are very pleased to present um, uh, our first of three National Poetry Month events. Uh, and um, we have with us, uh, Victoria Chang and Sophie Clark. Um, Kamiko Khan has been delayed, so Han and I don't know if, if she'll be able to make it. Um, joining me today uh, is uh, Heather Lindy, uh, who you met. Heather is the author of four books, all published by Algonquin. If you lived here, I'd know your name. Take good care of the garden and the dogs. Find the good which is this year's Alaska Reads book and her most recently published book of Bears and Ballads. And now to begin, um, I'll send it over to Heather. Thanks, Ron. And I'm really excited to introduce our poets today. And I hope that uh, Kamiko 
uh, gets here. Sophie Klar's poems can be found, of course, in Alaska Quarterly Review, but also The New Yorker, Poetry London, American Poetry Review, Agni, Blackbird, Plowshares, Poetry Ireland Review, Foglifter, Ziziva, The Rumpus, The Voices of Addiction feature, uh, Frontier Poetry and Elsewhere. She is the author of Meet Me Here at Dawn and the chapbook Versus Recovery. She is the recipient of fellowships and residencies from the Atlantic Center for the Arts and the Stadler Center for Poetry and Literary Arts, among others, and was a recurrent long-term artist in residence at the Art Farm. She's a teacher and offers many online classes in poetry for all levels. Details are at her website, sophieclar.org. Ariane Scholl says of her poetry collection, Meet Me Here at Dawn, it's really beautiful and vulnerable, dark and tinged with sadness. In some ways, it's as if Sophie is a modern day Sylvia Plath. There's the same melancholy and nostalgia present in Sophie's work. And that's the thread that weaves the two women together. But from there, it's an offshoot, a different branch of the same tree altogether. Sophie Clark, who says, poetry kept me company as I was growing up. And I think the poems I related to the most were poems that were just general enough for me to see myself inside them and just specific enough that I could feel exactly where I was. Victoria Chang is a poet and a children's writer. She's the author of five full collections of poetry, including Obit, Barbie Chang, The Boss, Sylvinia Molesta, and Circle. Her children's books are Is Mommy, Beach Lane Books, and Love, Love, Forthcoming. She's received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Catherine Min McDowell Fellowship, a Sustainable Arts Foundation Fellowship, a Poetry Society of America Alice Bay de Castanola Award, a Pushcart Prize, a Lannan Residency Fellow, and other awards. Her poems have been widely published, including in Alaska Quarterly Review and in the Best American Poetry. She's the editor of the anthology Asian American Poetry, The Next Generation, and she teaches in Antioch University's MFA program. Victoria Chang, who wrote in Obit, if you cut out a rectangle of perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no winds, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky, that is grief. She also said, I find all of poetry strange, truthfully, in the best ways. It's so mysterious and I love the process of writing because it's a process of discovery. There's nothing in the world that makes me quite as happy as when I'm writing. We'll begin with Sophie and we'll go to Victoria and hopefully Kamika will be here and when she gets here, I'll introduce her. But without further ado, Sophie. Um, thank you, it's such a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, what I'm going to read are mostly sonnets from a manuscript called Two Open Doors in a Field. Um, over a three year period, I drove by myself for around 15,000 miles on the loop basically between um, rural Nebraska and California. So that's where these poems come from. Sonnet at a McDonald's drive through on a 14 hour drive. I cannot write about America without writing about race. Every glass of water I drink is political. What happened in geologic time once now happens in lifespans. The president misspells a word. Blank number of children die in a school. The gunman is always a man. I can't draw an accurate map of any country. My grandpa's country has now been erased by borders. I thought of him for years only as my mother's father unrelated to me. Sometimes a glimpse spilled from her. As a child, he played in dusty streets with a ball made of rags. Driving through Oregon, listening to the radio. Watching Greek tragedies, unspeakable violence makes us feel on earth together. In this version, a woman has been cast as the hero whose cries are so stripping that her comrades abandon her. 
then realize they cannot win the war without her. In the ancient world too, this play was performed by veterans for veterans. This violence makes us feel at home together, these miles till bend, a needle threading blue within the tall pines, a stitched horizon. The story lost to static in the woods, the disappearing hem of sky, the first loss that caught me. It thunders, then it snows. Motel, Arizona. Beyond two nights in any motel seems to threaten moving on. Again, morning opens back the stiff plastic curtain to the asphalt galaxy, the glittering of a plot that swallows velocity. I walk from the edge of town to a store where vegetables shine and wince in my hands. I say something nice to the young cashier, return to the room, turn to a letter. Sometimes you just have to die about it, writes my friend. She means mourn in her broken English. Animals only pace in zoos. On TV, people are playing a game, clapping when the holes in the world are named. Parked, California. Before a child is born, an angel tells them everything all the secrets of the universe, and then kisses them on the forehead and they are born and they begin to forget. This stubbornly persistent illusion, time is an arrow. You were born goes the song, and in that the child is there. Music can be like that, wrought timeless. Proverbs help us to remember our grief is not unique. I eat a bag of chips parked in a strip mall's lot and meet the eyes of someone else parked eating. Three mirrors to watch the night in. Lower your eyes. Now listen. You were born into a strange world. Driving through Texas, listening to the radio. He dies in every living room in town, sings Johnny Cash. Feels like leaving Texas takes forever. In the next town over, a cheap room is waiting on me. A sign, the natural choice is life. A small rose with thorns painted childlike beneath. I am reassured, mine is a short life. Many beautiful ideas turn out to be wrong. Humans are just waves of happenings, and the more distance is, the more ache it has room to carry. Do you feel me? In the mid-morning fog, another sign. Abortion kills, Jesus forgives, and thus I am forgiven. What an idea. Uh, this next poem has some lines from Octavio Paz. driving through Kansas, listening to the radio. I've only ever seen the shadow of clouds on the ocean and on the plains, as in your body spilled on my body, seen dissolved makes the watching real. A choir on the river sings an arrangement of amazing grace, poultry like fall leaves sleep outside the dim light of the auction's door and just like that, it's gone. Another town whose name I'll never try to remember. I think before you came into my mouth, you were a fever made of my watching, a cloud shape I could know but could not name, like those walls printed with ash and honey, a pattern I could track but could not touch. Um, these next two poems are from a long series called Like Nebraska. Um, they all start with a simile line and uh, they owe much to Frank Stanford and his incredible similes. And they're untitled. 
He drinks like the faithful, the way they fold their hands in church, like two owls roosting in an elm. Karaoke night at the Don't Care Bar, a worker staggers following the lyric to a lit up song. And outside, a stranger chews their ears off about the green desert, fields of soy and corn, and soy and corn and soy, devoid of flowers, and the bees going damn drunk with hunger. She leans into him like a stray cat against a fence. A hundred species of insects, the stranger tells them, in a space where there should have been a thousand. A truck leaving backfires. Beneath the only streetlight, a possum practices its death. His hand at the small of her back, on the depthless roses painted on her old black dress. She sees like a memory aware of itself as memory. He is dressing in the half dark like some old movie, a man in a dream of farmland, his profile plucked from switchgrass, made visible by light casting its line inwards, his pale body smelling a flight like a familiar story, an entire landscape curving to pull on a pair of boots. Um, and this will be my last poem. It's uh, one of the only ones that I've written this year. <laughs> In other news, 2020. Someone ate a bat, they say. That's how it happened. Photographs of empty rush hours, empty Vegas, empty beaches. Fake news of swans and dolphins in Venice canals. True news of longhorn goats sprawling through small towns. This is not like last year, when starving polar bears reeled, ice lost, and half blind to scavenge dustbins in a torpement. An article claims with so many homebound by the pandemic, scientists suddenly are better able to hear the earth. Fires pour through trees and fields and towns for days and miles and miles. And a boy who went back home to rescue his dog and his grandmother is found in the driver's seat of a car with the dog draped over both their bodies. Across three days just before last Christmas, around 4,500 flying foxes fell in a heat wave. Some we get to in time, says a volunteer rescuer. Others die in your hands. A woman rips away her shirt to wrap in linen a darkly seared koala, and TV outlets run this as good news. More shaky footage a young man running on the shoulder near the flames and the rabbit he catches leaping from the burning bush. Yesterday, from six feet away, my neighbor tells me how walking in our neighborhood, they found a pear tree and ate from it, the warmest pear, they say. My skin has not been touched in seven months. I dream that night, they ask me to walk with them. Wouldn't you rather walk with me, they say, though nothing else has been offered. Heavy rain presses a flock of black-eyed Susans down and back together. Outside the frame of my bedroom window, I see the sky white behind the pines, and there is no particular end. Thank you, Sophie. Victoria? Hello. Um, I am going to read uh, from this book. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to Ron for inviting me and Heather Lundy, pronounced it correctly, Lundy, for in, um, the wonderful introductions. And it was so nice to hear Sophie read and so nice to meet you. Um, I'm just gonna read, I think I'll read just from this book today. And um, there's really nothing, and this is my new book, Obit, there's really nothing you really need to know except that 
my my mother um, passed away in 2015 of pulmonary fibrosis and um, that's when your lungs sort of harden and then you gradually suffocate to death and then my father who appears here quite a bit had a stroke about maybe 12 or 13 years ago so he lost his language and he's always around in these poems um, and they're they're shaped like little little obituaries this one's called memory Memory died August 3rd, 2015. The death was not sudden, but slowly over a decade. I wonder if when people die, they hear a bell, or if they taste something sweet, or if they feel a knife cutting them in half, dragging through the flesh like sheet cake. The caretaker who witnessed my mother's death quit. She holds the memory and images, and now they are gone. For the rest of her life, the memories are hers. She said my mother couldn't breathe and took her last breath 20 seconds later. The way I have imagined a kiss with many men I have never kissed. My memory of my mother's death can't be a memory, but is an imagination. Each time the wind blows, leaves unfurl a little differently. This one is called Friendships. Friendships died June 24th, 2009. Once beloved, but not consistently beloved. The mirror won the battle. I am now imprisoned in the mirror. All my selves spread out like a deck of cards. It's true, the grieving speak a different language. I am separated from my friends by gauze. I will drive myself to my own house for the party. I'll make myself, I will make small talk with myself, spill a drink on myself. When it's over, I'll drive myself back to my own house. My conversations with other parents about children pass me on the way up the staircase and repeat on the way down. Before my mother's death, I sat anywhere. Now I look for the image of the empty chair near the image of the empty table. An image is a kind of distance. An image of me sits down. Depression is a glove over the heart. Depression is an image of a glove over the image of a heart. This one is called My Mother's Teeth. And uh, my mother had dentures all growing up, my growing up, not her growing up. And um, there were teeth everywhere in the house. And so this, this one I think I wrote after I found one of many backup sets of teeth after she died. My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease. Once again, on August 3rd, 2015, the fake teeth sit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth, but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. When my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, her words around my mouth like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wonder whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wonder what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter, looking for meaning to attach to, like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring. I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. Um, so I, I, I wrote about 70 of these obituaries in maybe a two week period. And, um, and then I just stopped. <laughs> I don't remember why I always say this. I don't know why, but I just stopped. And then, and then I, and I didn't write for a long time. And then I thought I didn't know how to write it anymore, which I think happens a lot to writers. And so I started writing all these formal poems. So Sestinas, sonnets, villanelles, I've tried them all. Um, and I landed on a couple of these uh, tankas, which are Japanese syllabic forms. That, so it's five, seven, five, seven, seven, 31 syllables. And um, my friend who had helped me with this manuscript basically said all the other formal poems are so bad. So those should go in the trash and but these tankas are really nice keep them so I put two on each page and just sprinkled them throughout so I'll just read um, I'll read two sets or four total 
I tell my children that hope is like a blue skirt. It can twirl and twirl, that men like to open it, take it apart, and wound it. I tell my children that sometimes I too can hope, that sometimes nothing moves but my love for someone and the light from the dead star. Do you see the tree? Its secrets grow as lemons. Sometimes I pretend I love my children more than words. No one knows this but words. My children, children, today my hands are dreaming as they touch your hair. Your hair turns into winter. When I die, your hair will snow. I'll read a couple um, more of these obituaries and then I'll read some poems from the middle and then we'll see how much time I have left. This one's called Grief. Grief as I knew it died many times. It died trying to reunite with other lesser deaths. Each morning I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. The text kept interrupting my grief, forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky, that is grief. This one is called the blue dress. The blue dress died on August 6, 2015, along with the little blue flowers, all silent. Once the petals looked up, now small pieces of dust. I wonder whether they burned the dress or just the body. I wonder who lifted her up into the fire. I wonder if her hair brushed his cheek before it grew into a bonfire. I wonder what sound the body made as it burned. They dyed her hair for the funeral, too black. She looked like a comic character. I waited for the next comic panel to see the speech bubble and what she might say, but her words never came and we were left with the stillness of blown glass, the irreversibility of rain and millions of little blue flowers. Imagination is having to live in a dead person's future. Grief is wearing a dead person's dress forever. Um, this one is called The Clock. It's interestingly, I don't know why it's so interesting, but it's interesting to me. It's the only poem in the entire book that's more than one page. It spreads across two. It's not that long even. But um, I was listening to NPR one day in the car and um, a scientist was talking about how he could no longer uh, draw a clock. And he was able to speak perfectly well, but he was just, flummoxed by it and had come up with all these odd theories and so um I wrote about it and my dad used to we used to take him out when he could go out and he'd always um get questioned by the doctors you know what's your name when's your birthday and he wouldn't know any of it but the funniest was the clock test they'd, they'd give him intricate clocks to read and he'd have no idea this one's called the clock died on June 24th 2009 and it was untimely how many times my father has failed the clock test? Once I heard a scientist with Alzheimer's on the radio trying to figure out why he could no longer draw a clock. It had to do with the superposition of three types. The hours are presented by one to 12, the minutes where one no longer represents one but five and a two now represents 10, then the second hand that measures one to 60. I sat at the stoplight and thought of the clock, its perfect circle and its superpositions all the layers of complication on a plane of thought. Yet the healthy read the clock in one single instant without a second thought. 
I think about my father and his lack of first thoughts, how every thought is a second or third or fourth thought, unable to locate the first most important thought. I wonder about the man on the radio and how far his brain has degenerated since. Marvel at how far our brains allow language to wander without looking back, but knowing where the peer is. If you unfold an origami swan and flatten the paper, is the paper sad because it has seen the shape of the swan or does it aspire toward flatness, a life without creases? My father is the paper. He remembers the swan, but can't name it. He no longer knows the paper swan represents an animal swan. His brain is the water the animal swan once swam in, holds everything. But when thawed, all the fish disappear. Most of the words we say have something to do with fish. And when they're gone, they're gone. And I also added a bunch of poems in the middle of this book because it felt like the book needed a little more variety. So I just pulled a bunch of old poems from another manuscript that were, um, they're just all elegies. And I made them all 14 lines. So they're uh, artificial sonnets and um, put a lot of little spacings and sejuras in between. Um, renamed the whole thing uh, after a Sylvia Plath poem, Nick and the Candlestick. So the poem is called, I am a minor, the light burns blue and uh, worked on them for a little while. I'll just read a couple of them here. I'll read two. In the last parking lot in the last city, there are trees that look like nerve endings, scalps of leaves, thousands of birds in threes. Somewhere, the last people have stopped to place white rocks over dried volcano. Beth loves Jim and someone loves Matt. At the last party, the light lanced onto the last baby's face its body still slumping in ignorance. Once while teaching a child how to draw a person, I learned where it made only of circles and rectangles. I now know a body must loosen before it tightens. I now know a body can loosen and tighten with many men. I now know earth is a whole, not a sphere, meant to be filled with bodies, not with thinking. This one, oh, they don't have names. If darkness could be combed, there would be hundreds of knots, morning and night, cross on this concrete, a snail flattened into the shape of a screen, a fish has broken from the water, its rod of a body flickers on the dirt, walkers cross over its eye, somewhere a child tries to wake up by thrashing its body, somewhere bugs grip thugs of dirt and the worms look more beautiful dead. A bee catches on a stroller's wheel and crackles as if its heart can be broken. If we push the wheel forward, we ignore death. If we walk backwards, we repeat death. So we stand still and try to outlast death. They're kind of hard to read because there's also no punctuation. So never, never joyous um, to read those. So maybe I will read one more Ovid and just two more. Actually, I'll read one more Obit and maybe I'll read um, maybe two tiny little poems that are from a new manuscript. And this one is called America and it is the only poem in the book that's written as a prompt from um, Derek Sheffield at terrain.org who saw some of these Obits floating around in the world and asked if I could write, um, if I could write a few, uh, sorry, write a poem to his uh, America, which is his epistolary series. And um, this poem references the Florida shooting, the Marjorie Stoneman School. America died on February 14, 2018, and my dead mother doesn't know. Since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks, but my heart is damp still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its beats. The unlucky dead children hold telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings in shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child with a hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. 
I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia. Now I imagine long lines, my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket. The dead are an image of wind. And when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. And so I'll just read two short, tiny little poems um, from this new manuscript that I'm working on. And they're all in various formal, formal things going on in these poems. So they may not seem like anything much, but they were really, really hard to write. Okay. Um, actually, I don't even know. So I'll just, I don't know what pages. I'll just pick one. <laughs> this one is called When the War is Over. I once saw the deer. They were all wearing blue scarves. We have finally finished killing everything. We are now looking ahead, but have killed past the future. And then I'll end with one more tiny one. Let's see, this one is called The Notes. I stay in bed and listen for any music. Today is cheerful. It is overshot itself and is tomorrow. I'm left behind, waiting for the birds to return. They've moved on. I know, I now know that being birdless doesn't hurt. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Victoria and Sophie. And I take it that we uh, weren't able to get uh, Kamiko with us, or uh, I'm not really. I just heard from her, and she's uh, she's going to be trying to join, uh, okay. but she's not not ready yet. So we may or may not have her. So what we ought to do is kind of skip to our little conversation, and if yeah. she makes it, uh, oh, oh there she is right now. Right here. here she well, is. I just, well, while we're getting organized here, I just really want to thank um, uh, Sophie and Victoria for those poems. And I love the connection of both of you listening to the news and the radio or, and, and the grief and the current events all, all mixed up. I feel like that's, I think that's a 2020. That's what it gave us, right? The stuff coming in from radios and the internet and then what's happening in our own lives and it's all been mixed up. But um, welcome, Kamiko, I see is here. Uh, Kamiko uh, Han, I'm, we're so glad that you made it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you now. Uh, Kamiko is the author of 10 books of poems, including Foreign Bodies, Brain Fever, and Toxic Flora, both collections prompted by science. Uh, the Narrow Road to the Interior, The Unbearable Heart, which received an American Book Award, and Earshot, which was um, awarded the Theodore Rothke Memorial Poetry Prize and an Association of Asian America Studies Literature Award. Uh, she has said that all of her material, quote, issues from deep and very personal concerns, whether it is for girls to be able to express anger or the melting of glaciers. As part of her service to the CUNY community, she initiated a chapbook festival and that became an annual event co-sponsored by uh, major literary organizations. And since then, she has added oh, about a dozen chapbooks to her uh, over, including um, one uh, where she uh, collaborated with Tamiko Beyer called uh, Dovetail. Honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Penn Volcker Award, a Shelley Memorial Prize, a Liz Wallace Reader's Digest Award, and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, she's taught graduate programs at uh, the University of Houston and New York University and as a distinguished uh, professor in the MFA program in creative writing and literary translation at Queens College through the City University of, of New York. She also taught for literary organizations such as the uh, Fine Artworks Center, Cape Canem. Uh, and what, what I love about um, what she notes about her students, especially at uh, CUNY, is that her graduate students have included a first responder, a lawyer, a children's librarian, a pro soccer player, ticket taker at the circus, grade school teachers, proof, she says that, quote, a poet is where you least expect she or he will be. 
Um, and I, I, I love that as we come into National uh, Poetry uh, Month and our reading today. Uh, also from 2016 to 2019, she was president of the Board of Governors of the Poetry Society of America. Um, welcome. Uh, we're really happy to have you here, Kamika. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> and I'm sorry to be late in signing on here. Uh, thank you, Ronald. Thank you, Heather. Good to see Victoria um, and, and everyone. Um, I, in this um, crazy uh, world we're living right now, I knew it was Sunday, but I forgot it was Sunday. So I was actually out drinking a martini at a restaurant. And then I quickly came back. <laughs> So thank you. So thank you, Ronald, for reminding me. You are supposed to be reading a poem right now. And and yes, I will. Um, and I've gotten vaccinated twice. And Heather, is that a Olivetti Letera 22 on your desk? Actually, it's a Letera 32. <gasps> <laughs> I know. A really I, nice typewriter. <laughs> I know an Olivetti when I see one. I have a, I have the 22. That's yeah, this is a 32. My... So, and it's been fully refurbished and reconditioned. So it's like a, a, a rebuilt car. Yes. That was my first, <laughs> that was my first typewriter. <laughs> and I had a, uh, an undergraduate, yay, these decades ago, ask me if it was, if it had memory, <laughs> I said, whoa, no, it wasn't even electronic. So anyway, I will read my poem. Thank you so much for taking this poem, um, uh, which I think of as being a little eccentric. Um, maybe it isn't to anybody else. And, um, and also congratulations to um, the journal for all that it's done. Lonesome Kimiko. Okay, if my devices work. Lonesome Kimiko. Unlike George, Kimiko was not found on Pinta Island, an island thought to have not one tortoise left. Unlike George too, Kimiko has never come to recognize Fausto Yernana, the then 17-year-old ranger of said island. In fact, she's never met Down Fausto. In fact, no one like Down Fausto will ever say, he was like a member of the family to me. To me, he was everything. No one like Washington Tapia will cry because it was like losing his grandparents of Kimiko. Unlike George, the last giant tortoise of his subspecies in this archipelago, Kimiko's death will not represent the extinction of a creature right before another creature's eyes, I hope. Unlike George, Kimiko will never be on display post-mortem in a museum, I, I, I hope. Unlike George, however, a few people do ooh and ah over Kimiko, for which she feels eternally thankful. And Kimiko would count herself fortunate if in her usual morning spot when she dies. A hot shower with the radio on to girl group songs. Yes, like lonesome George, Kimiko has always been lonesome. Also like him, she has not been very often alone. Like him, there will be others, extinct tortoises, that is. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Kamiko, and um, thank you for being here. And, and your poem actually uh, uh, dovetails right into um, a conversation with us, unless you'd like to read another one. I'm not sure where, where you're at, but um, if you're comfortable 
but because writing about Kamiko and then we've written about Obitz and Sophie um, writes very much about grief uh, in, a, in a different kind of way in your Nebraska poems, especially, you know, relationships and Anyway, I'd love to hear um, each of you, maybe if you'd like, uh, because it is um, uh, National Poetry Month, um, a, a little discussion of poetry, but I thought in particular, because of the way this year has been and also the poems that you read, just poetry and um, politics, current events, how the intersection of, you know, poetry and and the outside world of the, of the media, the news, really, if, if that's something that you're comfortable talking about. If you're not, just talk about whatever you want, actually. <laughs> but you all seem to have connections that way. And I'm wondering, um, uh, uh, you know, where, where it comes from and how you, how you weave it in and out. Like I said, if you don't want to talk about that, it's <laughs> you can talk about whatever you'd like, but it seems like the world is coming in and, and it's mixing up in, in, in all of your poetry. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for me, um, it's really it really goes back to the role of, of writing and one's relationship with, with language. And so, because, you know, I write about things that I see or things that I hear, it's inevitable that those things appear in, in my writing. And I mean, I think an interesting question that we were talking about uh, a bunch of us um, on Saturday, actually in a poetry group that I met, we were reading a, a Zbigniew, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Herbert poem, um, and thinking about what makes a political, political poem political, you know, or is just the act of writing political? It's a fascinating question. You know, I think as a person of color, a woman, um, a person from, you know, multiple marginalized communities, I feel like every time I put the pen to paper, it is, it is an act, is a political act in some ways. So, so even if I'm not necessarily writing about, you know, violence against the body or the violence against the black body or the Asian body or politics directly, I feel like just by placing a pen to paper or finger to a keyboard, is it a political act just because of who I am. Um, but there are more overt ways, I think, to write about current events and things that are happening around us. Um, but as a writer, I mean, I think this is, I mean, words are air. And so <laughs> everything um, that happens in all of our lives or that we witness, it's a way that I navigate um, survival and living in the same way that I have to drink you know, liquids. And so, um, it makes sense that a lot of the poems that people I've been reading, other people writing, you know, there are all these pandemic anthologies. I just think that's, this is, this will be an interesting time, like a hundred years to look back on and see what kind of writing came out of this period. I would be interested a hundred years later to see what writing came out of this period. And I enjoy reading poems within the context of time periods as well. That was so not an answer to your question. No, it's no, this is great. It's a so babble. I see, you, yeah. <laughs> I see you nodding your head. Sophie, I see oh. you nodding your head and you, you, you began your first sonnet with, you know, that everything becomes, um, you know, drinking water is political. Uh, and, and maybe you could expand on that as well. Yeah, you know, I think what really happened for me this year, I started this class last summer um, called Shelter in Place, Writing Where We Are, because you know, so many of us just filled with a totally blank panic at the inundation of news and wild uncertainty. And I, I just thought, you know, what if I could cultivate a space where for two hours we could, you know, read poems that direct, redirected us to being present, um, looking outside instead of just being glazed over, thinking like, you know, what kind of tree is that? And through this class, um, you know, poems could touch on these tremendous swirling questions about climate crisis, about violence against minorities and our political responsibilities, um, being good an ancestors, um, honoring our ancestors and, you know, in being able to talk about all of those things through poetry and through a, a two hour class on Fridays, it became a space of 
rest and respite as well, which was so, just so incredibly important. Um, and it was nice to be able to have that community that's just been, you know, it's been an ongoing class since, since July, which is just wild. And um, I think it's been, it's been sort of, I think so much news comes at us constantly that being able to talk about it, you know, often poems that give us an opportunity to talk about politics through the lens of poetry um, has been a tremendous gift of, of this time. So, yeah. And, and Kamiko, obviously you're, you're working with students all the time. How, what's been your personal experience as well as your you know, experience as a teacher during this time? Well, um, my undergraduates who by and large live in Queens, the borough of Queens in New York are um, mostly immigrant students, first generation college. Um, you know, I've been teaching for over 25 years at Queens and I'm still learning what they don't know. And I'm still learning in, a, in effect what I don't know. And I'm a middle-class tenured professor. Um, I've been teaching at this place for a long time, but my, I, my students have, you know, on Zoom, they have siblings running around. They have a grandparent walking back and forth behind them if their video is on. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not usually speechless, but I am speechless when it comes to my students' conditions. Um, if they even have network. You know, so uh, uh, my graduate students are in a little bit of a different place, um, but they, culturally, but physically, they are not in a different place because they are, we are all in a room, so to speak. And uh, they, by and large, understand very much what's going on in the world, that it's about uh, um, society wanting us to compromise. And no, we won't. No, we won't compromise. Uh, we're not going to compromise our voice. And um, that's inspiring for me. That's inspiring to hear uh, that kind of energy. Because honestly, I've been uncharacteristically um, quiet. Uh, I usually write a lot. And I've been having trouble writing a lot in the past year. Um, but to feel that energy from my students is um, inspiring and to know what they're going through, uh, which is very different from my, my books, mm -hmm. my little, my little uh, study. I think I've forgotten the question. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's, I mean, I think all of you too, it's interesting to, you know, is it, you know, obviously we've seen that. I mean, that's the issue with um, everybody. My daughters are, are public school teachers in Juno, yeah. and Juno and and the same thing that it, be, it became a, a, a social issue uh, turning on Zoom or not um, because yes. of the, the places where different children lived. And this is in Juneau, Alaska, where you think, you know, really, but really. And um, uh, um, so, but I guess the question then would be, um, you know, given all of that, how it's it's amazing that their your students are are still studying poetry. Like, um, wh why do you think that right now is the time where where people are turning to writing poetry, sharing poetry, and more voices out there? What and and what is the role of people like all of of us who 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 are in more comfortable rooms to to elevate those voices? I don't know, each, you, all of you can answer that, I guess, if anybody has um, thoughts on that. 
Well, I'll just People, start, uh, I'll just start out with the word expression. Express. I'll just start out with that. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it goes back to the question you asked us originally, which is why we're you know, like why we are, some of us are able to write during the pandemic or why we write at all. And I think that, um, I do think a lot of people are turning to writing or reading, but I mean, I don't actually have any evidence of that. So I'm, 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 I'm not sure if there are more people writing poetry and I tend to be sort of, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a numbers oriented person. So I, I don't actually know if that's true, but what I do know is true is that, that um, because of Zoom and because, um, of technology and the pandemic and how everyone's gone online, I do know the paradox of what Kamiko talk, was talking about is that now that there's there's access too. So it's this weird kind of double-edged kind of thing that has multiple sides as usual, right? It's not binary. And so I've just been having a lot of people in the classes I've been teaching, if they're um, community classes or workshops or things like that, People dialing in from, I had someone in my class that I'm teaching now for the Miami Book Fair from New England or, no, sorry, us, I think it's Australia. I was going to say New Zealand, but I think it's Australia. Um, there, you know, there, there's so many great pe people who can just log in to the Los Angeles Times Book Festival that's going on next week. So I keep hearing that there are some of those access positivities, I suppose, which I think is really cool. Um, but obviously teaching at a university is different or, or young children, you know, K through 12 struggle big time. You know, I have two of my own that are in middle school and it has not been fun, um, but there have been some benefits that also come along with all the pains. And so I think it's just a mixed bag. Um, and I think we just do the best that we all can. And I think as educators, we do the best we can and we've been very flexible. Um, and, and, you know, as parents, we do the best we can. As students, we do the best we can. So I have, it's just, it's a really mixed bag. It just, and it depends on your socioeconomic situation. You know, it depends on your family situation. There are a lot of dependencies, but, um, so I think it's hard to make sort of generalizations like this is good or that's good. I think it just, it depends. It really does. But I have seen, heard a lot of people say that um, they've turned into events where there are like 500 people or something like that. And that is really cool. You know, people can now dial in from towns that they may, that nobody goes to in terms of, you know, traveling through and doing poetry readings because they're not near um, a lot of you know, bookstores or things like that. And now they can just call in. So that's been nice to see. Sophie, have you noticed that in your, in your online classes that there's more people are more interest in, in poetry or people are coming from different directions and hadn't, might not be typical of poetry workshop students in, in person? Oh yeah. I mean, I've had, my class has been incredibly diverse from um, I think during one of the sessions I had an 18 year old and an 81 year old and everyone's coming. I, I had plenty of students over the past months who have never written poetry that they've shown anybody or talked to with anybody. I think, you know, being, having the capability to zoom in uh, essentially feels like for some people who've never gone into a creative writing class or wouldn't otherwise want to walk into a creative writing class somehow from the safety of your living room, um, it's less daunting. And I think there's so many people who say, I don't understand poetry or I don't write poetry or whatever. And I've had students in my class, I think, who come in thinking, I don't write poetry and I don't understand poetry. Um, but there's something about being at home that enables people to open a little bit more or have had that experience in my um, in my class that it's been it's been pretty incredible actually and really and really humbling to be a facilitator for experiences like that and having people who think of themselves as capital P poets and having people who you know like reading and have never read a poem to anyone so 
Yeah, it's been quite, uh, it's been very humbling. That's sort of the main, <laughs> the main word that comes to mind about, about this year, I think. I love what you just said, Sophie, um, and also Victoria, the, you know, that both the access where we're, we're distance, social distance in many, many ways. Um, but also, as Victoria was saying, it's that double edged thing where, you know, we're distance and yet we have access. So we have people who are on the literally on the other side of the earth coming in and and being present with one another uh, or if they're not there synchronously in asynchronous they can go on youtube and participate and that's kind that's 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 truly amazing to kind of state the obvious. Well, I, I agree. And I think even uh, for me, actually um, being part of this um, literary series since, you know, I don't know when we started in November or something all the way through, uh, you know, every Sunday afternoon, I live in a very rural place far from anywhere. There's no way I'd get to go to poetry readings at the Anchorage Museum or, you know, with, with poets of your caliber or, um, you know, around the world every, every Sunday, pretty much. And anybody can tune in and like you say and then people are getting all excited because they're thinking well I didn't even know especially some Alaskans that are my friends that I turned they, they're like I didn't even know that poetry wasn't just all you know Shakespeare's sonnets or un unintelligible rhymes that I don't understand they they were like wow that you know uh, uh, Jane Hertford she was just writing about her dresser or or you know um uh Yusuf Komakura he's you know oh I know what he's talking about. Like, it, it, it's very interesting. And like all of your poems today, people hear them and go, wow, I, I like poetry now. Like I get it and I want to write it. And I think I really um, like um, Victoria's use of the, the haiku and the tanka. We have a little workshop in our own local library where people came and said, well, I don't know how to write, but haiku, start with that, 575. And they're really, really good, like all of them, every single one that people wrote, and then the Tonka going to a little longer, but just keep it like that. And it's not as scary for, for people who, who um, think that, that uh, poetry might not be as, as necessary in, in their lives. And I just, um, I just wanna thank all, you know, thank you for teaching and for writing and, and sharing your voices. And I also, I kind of, um, you know, want to give a, a shout out to Ron a little because of, you know, having a literary journal where, where especially a young poet, an emerging poet can publish a poem. You know, that's a, that's a game changer for, for your students. Um, but it's also a place where we can go, uh, people like me and, and read, you know, the whole world is there between the, between the pages. And that's, um, that's a pretty great thing too. So. I don't know where I went with that, but I usually don't talk so much, but I just, um, I'm really inspired by you and, and your poetry. And I don't know if anybody has anything else you'd like to say before I turn it back over to Ron, because we've kept you all a little bit later than usual, but um, it's been great. Well, I would just like to add my thanks to Ron. Um, I mean, how, how would my voice get to where you are, get to people who read your wonderful journal. I mean, how would that, how would that ever happen? So I, you know, I thank you. I thank you for uh, bringing my work into your pages. Okay, so Ron, I'm gonna let you um, sign off again. Uh, I do just wanna remind everybody um, that uh, on behalf of the Center for Lyric and Narrative Arts, thank you to our poets, of course, and then to all of you that are here. And a uh, little soft sell, but this is a fundraiser for um, the Alaska Quarterly Review. And of course it's free, but if you feel like um, contributing, it's easy. There's a button on your on your um, screen, and you can go ahead and do that. And uh, thank you for those of you that that have. And I'll let Ron give you a preview of what we've got uh, next week as we continue um, with more poets for National Poetry Month. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Heather. <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Sophie, Victoria, and Kamiko. And uh, very grateful to you folks, not only for um, the work, but for supporting our, our journal as we move forward after uh, 40 uh, decades, um, which is just getting to be, um, getting to kind of add up to some sizable amount of time. Um, our uh, series uh, continues through May 2nd. Um, our next two events uh, also celebrate uh, National Poetry Month. Um, uh, Sunday, um, April 18th features Nikki Beer, Mary Peelin, and Alexandra Teague. Uh, Sunday, April 25th features Victor, uh, Virginia Conchin, Elise Knorr, Kate Partridge, and Heather Tressler. And on Sunday, May 2nd, we have a finale, a CODA event, um, which promises to be uh, quite exceptional with uh, several um, emerging uh, writers, poets, uh, and a panel. Um, and it should be very exciting. And um, again, uh, with gratitude to the Anchorage Museum for uh, uh, sponsoring uh, this event and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts and to our amazing uh, moderator, who I even texted during the course of this event uh, because uh, you know, she, she's nimble, nimble with her old fashioned typewriter as well. So you see, you can't, you can't judge it. You can have both, both world. So um, thank you, Sophie. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Kamiko. And thank you, Anchorage Museum. And um, good night on the East Coast and uh, good afternoon to all of our fans here in Anchorage. Take care and be well.